<coughs> I came up with this uh, title uh, a little while ago, not realizing or not foreseeing what was going on in the world right now. And it's pretty interesting because, you know, the enemy does have a strategy to try and take us out. And he uses different methods. And I think last week when I talked about the truth of God, I gave a lot of passages in the Bible that encourages us from his word. So I wanted to uh, just uh, encourage everyone with these passages, and, and hopefully you'll get to read more of his word and be more encouraged by what he has for us, his promises, and what he says in the Bible about us, so that we cast out a lot of the stuff that the enemy wants to use against us. So I'm going to give you some of these methods in order to recognize the strategy he has and to be able to conquer them with the Word of God. So let's look at six hindrances that are obstacles to our growth. The enemy <clears throat> uses these to derail us from God's promises and the truth in his Word. Six hindrances. So, let's see. Is this going to work? Discouragement. Discouragement in life in general. Weakness. Our physical strength, our character, our whole soul, our whole being. Hopelessness. There's a lot of that going around today. People are running around scared and they feel hopeless. Giving up. I hear that all the time. We want to just give up, quit. Just at the finish line, almost there, and we just quit. Fear. We talked about that last week. That's a big one. Lack. A lack of. Lack of whatever is in your situation. Lack of finances. Lack of confidence. A lack of love. These are just a few I'm sure you can think of others yourself. So let's look at the first one, discouragement. In Deuteronomy 28, 13, if you listen to these commands of the Lord, your God, that I am giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. I think I talked about that two weeks ago. The being the head and not the tail will always be on top and never at the bottom. It's interesting that we will always be on top. You see, <clears throat> this could be many different things for us. In some, it means that you're struggling to find a job, so you're discouraged. Or your finances aren't going too well, so you're discouraged. Or maybe we're trying to reach out to family members, and they want nothing to do with you, so you're discouraged. Perhaps we're struggling with loneliness, so we're discouraged because we're always alone. <clears throat> you see, this happened in my life with my brothers and sisters. They didn't accept me as part of the family at one point in my life when I found Jesus, because I was a little different, obviously, and they didn't feel like changing, and so they... They had a lot of trouble and struggling with forgiveness. And I know that that's a key issue to uh, being healed. If you're struggling with forgiveness, if you don't forgive, you're not forgiven. And so, you see, it was difficult for them. They were always operating in uh, bitterness, and they were always angry. And so I had a lot of trouble sharing my new life with them. And so, you know... That could make me feel a little discouraged if, if I didn't know Jesus. You see, it's not easy being a Christian in a family that you're the only one that's Christian. B.C., I wouldn't have had a problem with it. But after Christ, knowing Christ, it makes a difference. You see, I dealt with all those things about forgiveness because I understood what God was saying in the Bible about forgiveness, that if I don't forgive, 
he won't forgive me. So that's very important to me. So I went through all emotions to forgive, even if I didn't feel that, you know, at the time it wasn't warranted, or maybe I didn't mean it in my heart. I was just doing emotions. I, I forgive them, I forgive them. But after a little while, you know, when you really mean you forgive them, there's this burden that lifts off your shoulders. There's this ugly, discouraging burden that comes right off your shoulders, and you automatically feel Christ's joy in your heart, no matter what situation you are in your life with your family. I went through a lot of things with my family, but you see, God's truth cleansed me with the forgiveness. And now the responsibility is on them. It's not my responsibility. I forgave them for what they've done. So I don't have any discouragement in my life. You see, we need to understand the word of God. And he says that we are redeemed by grace through the forgiveness of our sins. He will forgive all our sins and we will have freedom when we forgive others. There's a catch. You see, if we forgive others and their offenses, then we're forgiven. So his words changed my thought patterns, and I became more and more encouraged in all situations in my life. When my career at work, or when I was dealing with family, when I felt down or discouraged by anybody, about, about any re reaction that they had, it wouldn't enter my spirit because I understood and you know if I thought it should go this way but it didn't I didn't get discouraged if I wanted them to say something because I asked but they didn't say what I wanted I didn't get discouraged because of God's Word so you see we don't rely on others to encourage us although it's nice to receive words of encouragement from brothers and sisters I don't hold my breath waiting for them to encourage me. You see, the Word of God says it all. In Romans 8, 37, In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loves us. See, because He loved us so unconditionally. In Joshua 1, 9, Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous. <laughs> do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That was big for me. Because, you know, I didn't think I had it all together. You know, and... Uh, I look around and there he is. No matter what I did, no matter where I am, he's there. Because he said it. Wherever you go, he'll be there. So that encourages me. If I'm ever in a situation where I need his help or I need his encouragement, I'm not waiting for others to encourage me. It's him that encourages me. I have a bonus one here, Romans 15, 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Jesus Christ had. May the God who gives you endurance and encouragement. He knew we needed endurance because it's a tough ride. But we need to be encouraged because he gave us the same mindset as Christ had. And what was that mindset? What was the attitude Christ had? It was a, a mindset of compassion and love. He loved everyone equally. So I think that's what we should be walking around with, his compassion and love in our minds so that we are encouraged and we can endure. So the second one, Oh, I had that one up there. Sorry. The next one is weakness. 
See, the enemy wants us to think that we're weak and unable to overcome any adversities in our lives, that we can't accomplish anything because we're feeble beings and have no power. Well, some of us might think that that's a hindrance being weak, but we're not talking about brute strength, right? Maybe, but in the words according to 2 Corinthians, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient. I could stop right there. My grace is sufficient. That means it's everything. We don't need anything else. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So we should run around and say, I'm weak, I'm weak, I'm weak. Because in, with Christ in us, we have all the power we need. When we walk in weakness, we are all allowing Christ's power to rest on us. And with all the compassion and love that he has for people, we'll have. So I wonder what it would look like in the world today if everybody in the world just walked around right now in the humility and the love that Christ had. Think about it. I don't know if that'll happen. But it's my prayer. So we shouldn't rely on weakness because he is strong and if he is in us, we are strong. That's also in 2 Corinthians. We don't have a king that hasn't gone through anything and hasn't experienced it because Jesus went through it as we're going through it. In Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So we have an example to follow. It's not as if God is saying, do I say do as I say and not as I do. <laughs> Jesus went through the wilderness and was tempted in his weakness. Imagine 40 days in the desert, no food. I don't know if I can go three days without food. No, I can't go three days without food. <laughs> Let's get serious. 40 days. How would you look? How would you feel? Like really, you know? If someone came up to you, here, you want a burger? Come on, have a french fry. That'll be gone. <laughs> but he took the Father's words and proclaimed the truth and claimed a victory over the evil one. You remember the story. He wasn't tempted at all. He declared victory for God with his word. So we have a partner that will fight with us when we're weak. We just have to humble ourselves position our hearts in the right place and receive the truth and we'll have his power. Then we can walk in the desert for 40 days. Sometimes my life went through 40 days of desert here and there. You see, it's just like Moses had a lot of power when he realized who was working through him. He knew he couldn't do it on his own. In Exodus 4.13, hope I have that one. No, I don't. We'll just ignore that right now. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else because of his weakness. See, Moses almost missed his opportunity to be used by God because he thought, he thought of his weakness. How many times have we missed our opportunities? because of our weaknesses. See, God can make our weaknesses and make us mighty kings in all situations. Oh, so we're on to the next one. Right. Hopelessness. Number three. Hopelessness. Hmm, what's, what's the opposite of hopelessness? Hope. And we can find hope throughout the word 
and where it comes from. Psalm 62.5, it says, Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. It seems like there's many situations where we can feel hopeless. Why does this happen to me? What else can go wrong? I can't remember a time in my life when my wife and I were, uh, the kids were young and we were struggling financially and so we were just getting our nose out of the water and <clears throat> and all of a sudden, bang, something hits us. We just get financial blessing and then something hits us and takes it all away. And so, you know, I had nothing left to do except get on my knees and cry and go, why, God, why is this always happening? Why? And, you know, why are we always struggling like this? It was dangerous to do that because God, he told me. You know, the reality was that I was looking at it wrong because he's always working when we don't see him, right? Like the song. So he knew I was going to have this struggle in front of me all of a sudden. So he was already preparing finances to come. You see, I was looking at it from a hopeless point of view. We're trying to get ahead, and all of a sudden we get some finances. Yes, we can do so. And the car breaks down. And this check, $785. The car costs $740. Wow. So, boy, I had to change my whole thought process around from, oh, this is a hopeless, I'll never get ahead, to thank you, God, you made a way. It was amazing. <laughs> because his promise is for us to prosper right for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future Jeremiah love Jeremiah 29 11 say that a lot because it's true we declare it all the time because it's true so we have hope. See, God gives us hope through his plan of prosperity. And he'll protect us so we don't have to worry about the future. Thinking about tomorrow, <laughs> it just makes you miss what he's got for you today. We're always thinking about tomorrow. Oh, that's coming tomorrow. That's coming tomorrow. And then, you know, we, we start to get blinded of what God is actually putting right in front of you each day. So I have hope. First Thessalonians 1, 3. We remember before our God, our Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompt by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in your Lord Jesus Christ. So if we have faith and we know Jesus, he gives us the power to endure and we put our hope in Jesus, he takes all the hopelessness and despair away. He's our champion. We as brothers and sisters should always be encouraging one another. We should be as aspiring each other to greater things. We should be speaking life into each other. This is where prosperity begins. We should always have hope. We just have to look at it from a different perspective. The truth of God gives us a lot of hope. I'm going to go to the next one. Number four. I hope so. <laughs> I have hope. <laughs> Giving up. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah. Giving up. It's so easy to do. It's so hard. Oh, it's so hopeless. Oh, I can't do it. This is too, I'm tired. You know, this weapon the evil one uses so often, and you don't, we don't even realize it till it's too late. And he combines a lot of this, like giving up with hopelessness or giving up with weakness. So he combines tools in order to be even stronger. So it's harder for us. It's harder for us to defeat it unless we use the truth. 
You see, he works overtime, especially when we're working for the kingdom. When we're doing something to advance the kingdom, we can be, we can get feelings of being overwhelmed. So we get tired, burnt out, and we feel like giving up. So if we can recognize that we can control these feelings and who's making us feel this way, and we can feel better about all we do if we have the right motives in our hearts. You see, the devil would like nothing more than to make us feel powerless and too tired to do anything. No one cares. You're just getting tired. No fruit will come of it. No one loves you. Who cares? doesn't matter if you finish this or not. See, what it would have transpired if these people gave up? Noah. Oh, sons. I'm too tired. I'm going to go to bed. I'm not finishing this boat. You're crazy. That's got another 158 feet to do. You're crazy? Forget it. I'm going to bed. No boat. What about Moses? If he didn't pursue the promised land, the people would be perished in the desert forever. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Back it up. I, did I say that one? That's right. It's there. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. So we're not only going to get strength, he increases our power. So if we feel weak, put on Jesus, and we get power. You just get, you know, put on Jesus. Just keep putting on Jesus. He's our strength. He's our tower. He's our pillars that hold us up. He's our rock that we've made our foundation on. So he gives us the strength. Here's a big one. What if Jesus is carrying the cross? <sighs> Forget it. <laughs> and he walks away. What if Jesus gave up? Where would we be right now? I know where I would be. Where would you be? See, he had a chance to give up. He was in the garden, and he asked his father if there was any other way. Take it from me. <laughs> but him being connected with the father, he knew what the whole plan was. And he says, let your will be done, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's hard to understand that we have that determination in us because we accept Jesus. It's hard to understand that power he had at that moment to accept what was coming is the power that we could have in our hearts, in our spirits. When we accept it, then we don't have any other of those weaknesses or hopelessnesses. Fear. Pastor Dave did one heck of a talk last week on fear. It was amazing. I'm just going to touch on it because it's a major method the enemy uses to paralyze us, to keep us from our destiny. We take on the fear of man, fear of failure, Fear of not being accepted. What's going on today? Fear of lack, fear of depression, fear of loneliness. I can go on and on and on because fear just attaches everything in our lives. It can attack us in every area of our lives. So we retreat instead of move forward. We hide instead of coming out. Fear of man, we don't want to give our opinions on any subject because we're afraid they might not like what we say. Or we're not going to go to that party they invited me, but, I'm, you know, the crowd might not like me. Or 
I'm not going to take that promotion at work because, you know, I don't think I've got the goods to deliver. So uh, maybe I'll just stay in the background. And so you allow fear to control us. And we'll walk around like we have cement shoes on. Not able to do anything. And we'll sink and not survive. Here's a saying we should be saying. I'm not going to survive. I'm going to thrive. Because I have the power of Jesus. Whoops, I was already there. The spirit you receive does not make you a slave so that you live in fear. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. Adoption to son What does that mean? Adoption to sonship. Wow, the family of God. We are part of the Almighty God's family. The all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing Father. Abba, Father. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. We can declare this every day. I will not be run around and shown that I'm fearful. I've got the power. Whoo! I got the power. I know that. <laughs> 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. No one who fears is not made, uh, sorry, the one who fears is not made of perfect in love. That's a famous verse. Simple steps to take. Not to have fear. Operate in love as God loves. Loving keeps the plan of Satan at bay. He has no effect on us. He can't penetrate the spirit of love. Isn't that amazing? Satan cannot penetrate my spirit because I have God's love in me. I'm walking around with Jesus' power. He tries. I get a little bit, uh -huh. But then I'm back up because I'm encouraged by the word God promises me. He abides in me. You see, actually, Satan is in fear. He finds out that we understand who we are and who abides in us. He's shaking in his boots. He definitely is. And when we start reading the Word of God, he's like, oh, no, they're going to get the truth. Oh, my God, they're going to understand. And then he has no power on us because now we know. I would rather read God's Word, the truth, and start understanding it, and start walking it out, and knowing the promise he has for me, than to let the devil try and take me out. Number six, lack. Lack of finances, love, faith, friendship, etc., etc., etc. Lack of whatever. I thought I was in lack many years ago. Oops, no, oh, sorry. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So you see, we, we, Jesus walked into his own town and they had a lack. And what did they miss? They missed the move of God. They missed the opportunity to know that God was walking among them. They missed the opportunity of salvation. They missed the opportunity to learn all the good things that he, learned, he taught us while he was on the earth about loving one another with compassion. There was so much that city lacked just from that one decision. Lack of faith. If the evil one could put doubt in our faith, then he is put a a crowbar in to lift and he is there if he has put doubt in our faith he can move God out of our lives it'd be hard to believe that Jesus moves in power if we don't have faith to me the answer to lack is Jesus 
Actually, the answer to every question is Jesus. <laughs> but, but if you have lack, put Jesus in your heart, and then you won't feel that lack anymore. Luke eighteen twenty two. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. It tells me that if I run after treasures on earth, I'll still feel lack. I'll still feel empty. About 40 years ago or 35 years ago, that was me running after I don't know what, thinking I can fulfill the emptiness and the lack in my heart with different things. And it didn't work. I was still empty. I still lacked because I didn't have Jesus. I didn't have the power that comes with it. You don't feel satisfied. You're never full. You're always feeling empty. So what he's saying is that you give it all away and you'll get the treasures of heaven. What's the treasure of heaven? Because then he says, come and follow me. Which means he's following his treasure. <laughs> Jesus is the treasure. Knowing these traps... And how to counter them will give us less of a struggle to achieve the gold, knowing that we have Jesus on our side. God didn't put us on the earth to be bumps on the log. We were given dominion over the earth to prosper and to have a great future and tell everyone about the love of God that's for them, Jesus. So we have a counterattack. How do we battle discouragement? With encouraging words we find in God's truth. Read the promises God has for us. How do we get rid of weakness? Well, with the Holy Spirit's strength that Jesus said that he would send to us. Uh, he's going to send us a friend. And he did. <clears throat> How do we overcome hopelessness? By letting Jesus into our hearts, the hope of glory. How do we stop giving up? <laughs> by being encouraged through perseverance, by seeing others not giving up. And we encourage one another cheering each other on. And how do we battle fear? With perfect love. Love that casts out fear. And last but not least, how do we overcome lack? By understanding that He is sufficient for all situations in our lives. God supplies all of our needs. So that's my message for today. Oh, back up. So this is the counterattack. Today, I think the evil one's strategy is really working overtime, especially <laughs> in this situation with the coronavirus. There's, uh, I believe even Christians are fighting Christians, not knowing what to do. Um, in my own mind, to be honest, in my own mind, I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted by knowing the truth, standing on his word and the power knowing that he is protecting me, Psalms 91. And at the same time, 
I want to do what's right because Jesus also told us to follow the rules and the laws of the land, right? And so if the government is telling us to stay isolated or stay away or, well, because it's, it's for safety of the elderly. So now I'm like, hmm, okay. I want to walk around and just be free because I know Christ is in me and I know that I'm going to be safe. But if, if I walk around with the virus and I don't know it, then I can possibly give it to someone and, and, and if they're older and they have a weak immune system, complications could happen. So I'm praying a lot. I, I hope you are. And I'm not allowing the evil one to use his strategy against me. I'm going to continue reading God's word. I'm going to continue learning. I'm going to continue praying for everyone. And I'm continuing to pray that God comes and cleans this place up with his healing. Because he said he does. Our stripes. By his stripes we are healed. And so, Father, I just pray right now that you come. Holy Spirit, come and cleanse this earth with the blood of your son, Jesus. That this virus has no right being here. And we declare your goodness, Father. We declare your healing power on this earth right now in everybody that has contacted this virus. Father, we ask for your healing. In Christ's name, thank you.